Welcome aboard. I'm Bonnie Height. My husband Bob and I are producing a program called Campsites. It's part travelogue, part documentary, a lot of adventure, and a little bit of situation comedy. Campsites takes us across the country, and we're not limited to land. We cover aquatic camping, too. Our mission is to explore America and to document it all as we go. How we go about documenting it is part of the program. We work our work into the storyline. For instance, how Bob is getting this shot. These days, practically everybody takes a video camera on vacation with them. Not one of these, perhaps, but a home video camera. So how we shoot the program is part of the program. And in the process, our viewers can pick up some pointers they can incorporate into their own family productions, portions of which are featured in a regular campsite segment called Campsite Correspondence. But our primary mission is to discover America and meet the people who are out there exploring it and trying to preserve and protect it. In early October, it was already late fall up in the mountains of Utah. And at the higher elevations, winter's already set in. So when these lowlanders from Florida were seen heading uphill, well, some of the locals were real surprised. They shook their heads in disbelief. But hey, how often do we get to see snow? Of course, it's not often we get to drive in it either. And so we headed back down where we found a climate we were a little more accustomed to but not the scenery. What spectacular topography. And though it looks pretty rugged, the environment in the West is threatened just as it is in Florida. Can you imagine this scene with a factory in the middle of it or a housing development? It's only through the acquisition and preservation of these places by government or private environmental groups that we can preserve them. So we're guests of the Southern Utah Wilderness Association. They told us to come up and paint so they could get more people interested in their idea of preserving the wilderness here. We discovered Barbara Zaring and Elise Frank parked on the precipice of a canyon. Barbara's family lives in Sarasota. She and Elise sell their paintings to raise money for preservation. It's very beautiful, of course, and it's different than where we live. And we like to go out on the spot and um, find new places to paint. Exactly. So we're doing our part, and we hope our paintings will help. Isn't it remarkable the ways people find to help protect the environment? While Bonnie and I host the program, the stars are the people we meet in and around the campsites we visit. If you travel by RV with no itinerary, your only commitment is to your own curiosity. You see a dirt road, you take it. And at the end of this one, we found a Shangri-La of lakes. We weren't alone. Dave Jones sat on the bank fishing. He wasn't catching anything, but he was releasing. Releasing the pressures built up over the past few months. You see, Dave was a psychiatric nurse from Oklahoma City. In nature, he found his most effective therapy. The bombing was, it's one of those things that sort of puts you in touch with your own fragile existence, you know. This is where I find my peace. That sort of uh, serenity puts you back in touch with who we are. Farther down the road, we went on an outing with an old friend named Medray Carpenter. Med knows a lot about Colorado and its creatures, and on this occasion, it was a lesson on beaver dams. We make new land all the time. Instead of the uh, topsoil being washed out of the whole area, it's, it's stopped behind the banks of these, uh, these dams here and is saved. And then as these fill up, a new uh, plants and trees and grasses all grow, again, with that very, very fertile soil. Meanwhile, while Bonnie and I were out shooting the interview with Med, his wife was back home getting some interesting footage of her own. A local resident had come down out of the woods to inspect our RV. Oh, can you, well, can we play with him? <laughs> And finally, some scenes from our visit to the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, where we ran into some other locals. David Lael Kremski from Dunedin, Florida. Hi, Tampa Bay. Okay, here you go. Okay. You're turning. Oh, and my wife, Bonnie, You're turned turning. 40. Okay. Naturally, I was rolling at the exact second it occurred. Bingo. 11, 54, 55. I'm 40 years old. 
Happy Let's birthday. party. Happy Thank birthday. you. It totally gets better. Uh, from here, it's all downhill. That's what they yeah. did down here. It is. <laughs> we can get another one. In our first edition of Campsites, we'll be traveling to our country's ultimate aquatic camping region. I'll bet you can guess where it is. They're called the Florida Keys, but they are America's paradise. A string of tropical islands and atolls that stretches nearly 200 miles through the blue-green waters of the Gulf Stream. These gems, strung through a jeweled sea, attract millions of Americans and visitors from around the world. But there is an even greater treasure hidden just offshore. Like an aquatic crown surrounding the Keys, the coral reefs. You don't have to be a diver to camp out in the Keys, but you do if you want to camp out aboard the Aquarius. For almost three years, a barge has been anchored off Key Largo. It hasn't received much fanfare or even notice, but it is to the ocean what Cape Canaveral is to space. A launch pad for aquanauts who are traveling to the Aquarius. An inner space station deployed 70 feet down on the edge of the reef. Aquarius is a joint effort by NOAA the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the University of North Carolina. Aquarius allows scientists to accomplish in days what would otherwise take months or even years. Working from the surface at these depths, scientists can make only two dives a day and then stay only briefly on the bottom as they must allow for decompression. But by living at depth aboard Aquarius, they don't have to decompress until their mission is completed allowing them to stay as many days and nights on the reef as their mission requires. As a consequence, this inner space station has allowed research on coral reefs to rocket ahead. Scientists from here make excursions down to more than 100 feet, and they have hours that they can spend. If you're diving from the surface without decompression, it takes you have only about 20 minutes. You get the kind of insight that you get when, for example, you go to stay in a city or stay in a forest for a while instead of just driving through. Among the members of the Aquarius crew on this mission, world-renowned marine scientist and explorer Sylvia Earle, the former head of NOAA. Dr. Earle believes Aquarius is an essential resource in restoring and preserving the reefs and the myriad of marine life they support. This is more than a home on a reef. This provides access to the sea in a different sort of way. It's as justifiable in, in many ways as having the investment in a space station. Uh, we could say, why not just send people up for bounce dives in the sky? But there is perceived to be a real reason to keep people up for, for long periods of time, to get insights that you can't get from quick visits. And that's exactly the sort of advantage that having Aquarius sitting here on the reef for, for long periods of time, allowing people to come and stay and to really become residents and to see the ocean from and to see the planet from the inside out. Life support in the form of air and power flows to the Aquarius from the barge above where another team of scientists and divers constantly monitors the activities and conditions below. All right, see you later. The surface crew also collects and catalogs the information and specimens gathered by the aquanauts but their principal responsibility is the safety of those living and working below. To that end, this state-of-the-art dive platform is equipped with a hyperbaric chamber. Should divers suffer decompression sickness, or the bends, they can be treated right on site. Back on the bottom, the Aquarius aquanauts continue their research. But for how long? Regrettably, government funding for the project is in jeopardy. Science Director Stephen Miller. Coral reefs support a South Florida economy estimated at uh, over a billion dollars a year. That includes fisheries, diving, uh, recreational activities, and the health of the system, the condition of these reefs provide the foundation upon which people come down here to enjoy the, uh, the environment. You know, millions of people visit the Keys. 
Um, not too many get into space. Uh, a space shuttle mission, 500 million to a billion dollars, that's enough to run our program for over 500 years. Most importantly, we need to understand how the ocean works so people, first of all, can care and secondly, to take care of the ocean that takes care of us. Also on our first show, we'll visit another campsite that's brand new, though it's rather old. The Florida Keys. They've changed a lot over the years. A booming population has brought modernization and urban sprawl island style. But one island in this chain has stayed much the same. Pigeon Key is being restored and preserved for posterity. About the turn of the century, this tiny five-acre island was an important waypoint in the construction of what was then called the eighth wonder of the world, the Overseas Railroad. If Flagler hadn't decided to build this seven-mile bridge and a railroad back in the early 1900s, it'd probably still be sitting here as a, as a rock sticking out of the, what is it, the confluence of the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean. It Dave Whitney is executive director of the Pigeon Key Foundation. But it had no significant importance, except it was just far enough down the bridge to a construction camp. And they had 400 and some people living here. But then after they got the bridge done, they needed people to operate the bridge, and they needed people to paint the bridge and maintain it. And this became the village where they lived and, and took care of the bridge. Derailed by a hurricane in the early 30s, the train service was replaced by traffic, and Pigeon Key, bypassed entirely by a new highway bridge built in the 80s, fell into obscurity. But today, thanks to the Pigeon Key Foundation, the island has a new lease on life as a national historic site. All the buildings are being faithfully restored to their original condition, and closed to the public for years, it is now open to all. They can either take a tour, or they can if they're signed up for a course, they can go diving and all that, or they can just bring a picnic basket and sit under the tree and enjoy it. Pigeon Key is not only a repository of Florida history, it's making history in the form of scientific discovery. Using the island as a base, moat marine scientists are also in the race to preserve our coral reefs. Not only essential habitat for marine life, the coral in the Keys is an essential element in Florida's economic life bringing thousands of divers and millions of dollars into our economy. Dr. Eric Mueller of Moat Marine is among those trying to unlock the secrets of the coral reefs. As is the case with any patient, tissue samples must be taken. Using a pneumatic drill, Dr. Mueller bores a series of cores into the coral and carefully extracts each specimen. Hey, these are colony C, and the first set was colony A. They're brought to the surface where scientist Lori McLaughlin quickly immerses them again in salt water. For Lori, this is a special assignment. The kind of work that Eric's working on is going to benefit restoration, which is the restoring areas that have been damaged by, say, vessel groundings, um, other impacts, primarily human impacts. And so this is very significant research that we can use it hopefully to cultivate corals and then take them back and transplant them in these areas where they've been removed by some impact. After hours of drilling, the cores of coral are rushed back to Pigeon Key and Dr. Mueller's unique coral nursery, where he's trying to identify the reef's environmental enemies. We have to, number one, know what the problem was. Number two, we have to know that that problem has been eliminated, at least that acute problem. If we have corals just dying for some reason that we don't know, it would be a waste of time for me to be putting corals back there where they may succumb to this unknown. But once we do begin to take care of those problems, then we could start restoring other areas. Pigeon Key is not only an outpost for veteran scientists, future scientists are welcome here too. Both Moat and Pigeon Key conduct camps here, and children come from across the state and throughout the country to attend. It's hard to imagine a more peaceful, yet exciting campsite for kids. 
And for college interns like Cheryl Bass, none more inspiring. It's wonderful because I uh, have a double major in marine biology and psychology, so it's a great experience for me. I'm learning a lot from the kids. Thanks. Okay. Did you have fun? Yep. Great. <laughs> Do you know what it's called? Sea urchin. And what's special about the sea urchin? It's protection. Yes. That's true. It's got a real neat protective system. All of these fines, there's some that are real dangerous. This one isn't real dangerous, unless, of course, you yes. step on it barefooted. <laughs> Dr. So Dan Gallagher is in charge of the camp program. We're trying to get them in touch with the environment, in touch with the world. You know, a lot of them are, uh, are city children, suburban children, who go outdoors uh, twice a year. <laughs> they come here and they live here for three days and they don't forget it. It's really an unforgettable experience. Pitching Key is a very special place. It was fell into a crack in time in a way, and that's why these island, this island and the buildings you see around here today are, are just something that's got to be preserved. And we are preserving it, and not only that, we're using it. This is working on being a world-class education center. In addition to all the activities on and around Pigeon Key, neighboring keys provide fascinating field trips. For instance, the Dolphin Research Center. It's a regular stop. Pigeon Key, rich in history, and with every young camper creating a new legacy. Campsites. Every week, the latest on new RVs and accessories, camping equipment, instruction and safety tips, and of course, campsites correspondence. Campsites is a program that will celebrate America and those who are out to discover it firsthand. Campsites will not only educate and motivate, it equips its viewers with the information they need to take action. Whether it be by motorhome or trailer, fifth wheel, pop top or tent, our intent is to inspire our viewers to get out of their armchairs and into the driver's seat.